is an MSc um, candidate at the University of UKZN in the Centre for Water Resources Research. He has recently submitted his MSc thesis. He's been working with us up in the Maputaland coastal plain um, on an impact project, which uh, where we where we it's got a lot of disciplines interrelated. And he's going to give you a little bit of a deep dive into the component he's been working on, and I'm sure um, it will highlight some of the complexities of trying to integrate across various different disciplines. And it's now time to see if all his hard work, blood, sweat and tears in the field and behind the computer has, has actually uh, led to any results. So Mkulu, with that, I'd like to hand over to you. Um, and just yeah, before we do that, I just wanted to, I know there are a few people from way and beyond um, and some new people who might be listening in on the sound series. So just a very warm welcome to you. It's a fairly informal affair. It's very much centered around sharing and exchanging and developing our science together in, in, with through sound. Okay, Mkulu, over to you. Thank you, Sue. Just want to check can you hear me clearly that is correct we can you can go ahead okay thank you sue for that introduction um good afternoon everyone thank you for taking the time to join me today for my talk so uh today i'd like to talk to you guys about a groundwater model that i've been updating as part of the ongoing wrc project um, the WRC project is titled advancing water and income security in the unique maputa land coastal plain which my master's thesis fell under this WRC project. So one half of my master's thesis was focused on updating this previously developed groundwater model, while the other half was looking at uh, plant water source partitioning using isotopes. But for the purposes of today's talk, I'll just be focusing on the groundwater modeling component as it's the component that has been carried over into this ongoing WRC project. Before I start, I'd like to just acknowledge my supervisor, Professor Sefu Gurmesa, and my co-supervisor, Susan van Rensberg. Okay, let's get into it. So study site is the Lake Sibaya Groundwater Catchment, which is located in the Umtlaba Lingana local municipality. Now, the Lake, uh, the Lake Sibaya Groundwater Catchment is groundwater and rainfall dependent, which means that we have no rivers flowing into the groundwater catchment of Lake Sibaya. So lake water levels as well as groundwater levels, um, is basically lake water levels and other surface water bodies are a reflection of the rainfall occurring over the area, as well as the groundwater store in the area. Now, the Lake Sibaya area has been affected by declining water levels, particularly from the early 2000s until recent years, declines in the lake water levels as well as the groundwater level. Mambazwana and Seleni towns obtain water directly from Lake Sibaya, while the surrounding communities utilize boreholes that tap into the groundwater, um, that tap into the groundwater store of Lake Sibaya. So the main communities that are that are utilizing the groundwater catchment of Lexipaya is the Mabasa, Bela, and Dembe tribal council areas. Now, Lexipaya is a Ramsar wetland site of international importance, and it has significant ecological value, which supports tourism. And tourism is one of the main economic drivers uh, of the area. Due to the declining water levels uh, in the lake as well as the groundwater. Um, the Lake Sibai area was prioritized for a reserve determination study by the Department of Water and Sanitation, which was detailed in the 2015 report. The two main drivers of decline that were highlighted in this report was the below average rainfall, mainly from the early 2000s to recent years, as well as forestry plantations, mainly focusing on eucalyptus um, trees. However, the relative attribution of these um, known drivers of declines um, with regards to the water levels has not been resolved. So the WRC project is an interdisciplinary project that is being developed with the community from the beginning until the end. The project is in response to the community members wanting to explore different land uses and land covers in the study area as an alternative to forestry plantations. So the study is looking at 
um, the water and economic implications of changes in land uses and land cover under different climate scenarios and looking into the future as well. So some of you may have seen the previous seminar by Susan von Riensburg, which was um, which took place last year, October. So she went into detail on the entire WRC project and how it's, it's, it's coming together. So I won't go into detail regarding the, the whole WRC project. I'll just be focusing on the groundwater modeling component that I was responsible for. Now, just a quick overflow of the, of the WRC project. We have climate data being provided by our climate scientists that is going into the acro-surface water model, as well as land use and land cover data. So the acro-surface water model is being run by uh, Dr. Michelle Touche, who then provides me uh, with recharge uh, data to the groundwater model. Using the groundwater model, I then simulate lake water levels and groundwater levels in the catchment. Then, um, yeah, I simulate these water levels in the catchment under different land uses and climate scenarios. And then I provide this data to the economic uh, scientists using the economic model. They then look at the implications of um, these different scenarios on the economy of the system, the economy of the area. All of this information is then communicated to our stakeholders who are mainly the, di the different tribal councils in the area and the decision makers in the Lake Sabai area. So, pardon me. The aim of the groundwater modeling component is to increase confidence in the relative attribution of the known causes of declines and provide future scenarios due to climate and land use in the area. Now, the Lake Sibaya, uh, Lake Sibaya in particular has been functioning below the ecological reserve, which was set by the Department of Water and Sanitation in the 2015 report, of which one of the conditions was that the lake should not be below 16.5 meters above mean sea level for more than five consecutive years, of which based on SEON data, uh, the lake has failed to meet this condition. Now, the groundwater modeling work is evaluating and improving on prior modeling attempts, mainly focusing on the groundwater model developed by Professor Bruce Calby, who was my groundwater modeling mentor for my MSc and for developing and updating this model. And then um, in his previous model, he linked the mod for groundwater model with the accru surface water model in a loosely coupled scheme. Now, the accru surface water model is able to account for various hydrological processes and provide um, numerous outputs, including runoff into streams and rivers, and also deep water percolation, or basically um, seepage or infiltration of water into the groundwater store. Now, previous authors um, and previous research in the area has indicated that uh, the sandy substrate of the, of the groundwater catchment of Lake Sibaya is not very conducive for runoff to occur. And therefore, um, runoff is taken as non-existent in our models. And we are focusing mainly on groundwater or mainly um, water seepage into the groundwater store. So one thing I would like everyone to keep in mind is that in the previous um, coupling uh, technique that was used by Professor Bruce Kelby, the ACRU model utilized the, um, the, the, yeah, the ACRU model utilized the groundwater subroutine, which was able to simulate water seepage from the intermediate zone into the groundwater store. And this water seepage was then provided to the mud flow groundwater model as a recharge. The main link between the acro surface water model and the mod flow groundwater model is the recharge being provided by the acro model to the mod flow model. Now, for our um, for, for our updated model and coupling technique, we were not able to utilize um, um, the groundwater subroutine, and I will explain further on as to why. But just to keep that in mind, that they utilize the sub the groundwater subroutine to provide recharge to the model groundwater model. However, um, there were some issues with the recharge that was being provided to the previous groundwater model, which was mainly relating to that uh, the recharge was static over time and space. Now, this was due to the land use uh, distribution being stationary over time, mainly from 1950 to 2017 being the model um, 
simulation period. The only land uses that were being married with thyme included pine, eucalyptus, and specific other vegetation types. Now, the other issue was that the recharge was only being simulated for the lakes of background with the catchment, which I will show you guys in the coming slides. So this meant that um, the recharge was only simulated for a portion of the entire model domain as the groundwater model domain is much larger than the lakes of background of catchment. And so recharge data had to be extended to these other areas which was not very reflective of the actual recharge going to those land use uh, land uses across the area. Now, we decided to take a different approach, um, mainly focusing on getting the spatial distribution of recharge correct across the model. So we decided to utilize a grid-based approach for which we had a grid um, based on the modflow groundwater model grid that covered the entire um, model domain area. So this allowed us to use gridded climate data, which covered the entire model domain, as well as land use data, which covered the entire model domain. And then this data was utilized in the accru surface water model um, to start simulating the, the recharge that was then provided to the um, mod flow groundwater model. Now, as I mentioned that in the previous coupling technique used by Professor Bruce Kelby, they utilized the groundwater subroutine for the aqua model, which was able to simulate um, the water flow from the intermediate zone to the groundwater store. Whereas since we are utilizing a grid-based approach, it limits us in terms of not being able to utilize the, sub, uh, the groundwater subroutine. And therefore um, we had to take recharge coming from the second soil horizon and using that as recharge to our groundwater model. However, there is no certainty as to which method is better as we were mainly focused on making sure that we get the recharge across the entire area correct. As there is an understanding that there is an east to west gradient in rainfall over the area, which was not captured in previous models. Now, just a bit of background on um, the, the, the studies that have been done in the area. Um, various hydrological and geological studies have been conducted, which have um, increased oh, knowledge. Okay. And that, 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 um, okay. okay, thank you. So numerous studies have, have been conducted in the area, which has uh, built on the hydrological and geohydrological um, knowledge for the Lake Sibaya area and also for the Maputa land coastal plain as a whole. However, for the purposes of our study, we are just focusing on the groundwater model that was developed by Professor Bruce Kelby, which was linked to the previous ACRU model developed by Smithers, uh, Professor Smithers in 2016. So these two models were linked in a loosely coupled uh, scheme, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with recharge being the main link between the two models. Now, the justification for using this approach instead of other different um, modern approaches is the available expertise behind both of these models, the available expertise and experience, and also that ACRU is able to account for land use very well, and land use determines how much water goes into our model. Secondly, um, so this technique provides a novel approach to, to, to studying the water system of, to studying the water system as a whole, but mainly in particular, the Lake Sibai water system as this loosely coupled approach involved with aqua and mod flow has never been used before apart from the study by Professor Bruce Kelby. And also lastly, there is proven capability of this loosely coupled approach to, um, to be able to simulate the Lexibi water system fairly well. And also given that I was doing this as part of my MSc, I did not have the time to actually develop a new model from scratch. Now, there were some limitations, however, with the model that was uh, developed by Professor Bruce Kelby. Just for reference, this is Professor Bruce Kelby here. So um, one of the limitations included the short record of stream flow measurements that were available um, for him to be able to validate the stream fluxes being simulated by his model. The other um, limitation was the inaccuracies in the lake water level record which has been mentioned in, by numerous other authors in the past, as well as the poor attribute information for boreholes and wells in the area, 
due to some of the previous boreholes not being drilled with the GPS present, or also um, detailing or yeah, detailing or reporting of the attribute information for these boreholes and wells not being done correctly. Also, um, accurate survey information with regards to heights above mean sea level was not available for prior uh, models. And um, the climate data, mainly rainfall, was being provided as point data based on three meteorological stations within and around the periphery of the Lake Sibai area. And as I mentioned, there is a gradient from east to west um, regarding rainfall that has been documented in the past. And use, just using these three meteorological stations does not really account for this gradient very well. So the improvements to the groundwater model can, or to the modeling approach as a whole, can be subdivided into two categories. Firstly, we have improvements to the input data of which we utilize uh, a satellite derived gridded historical climate data, which was able to cover the entire model domain. So this is the groundwater model domain that we are utilizing in our model. And as I mentioned previously that for the, for the previous model by Professor Bruce Kelby, they utilized, they only were able to simulate recharge for the legs by groundwater catchment, which is delineated by this red line. And so they had to extend the recharge to the other, um, to the surrounding areas, which was not very um, reflective or representative of the actual recharge going through or actually occurring there. So that is why we're utilizing our grid-based approach, also utilizing gridded satellite data to provide climate that can be able to provide us with rainfall and temperature and other climate variables across the entire model domain to be more um, reflective or representative of the actual data. We also utilized um, land use and land cover data adapted from the Sun Lake database, which also um, covered the entire model domain. Now, this accurate land use um, land cover data was used in the ACRU model to provide gridded dynamic recharge data. Now, the recharge data was dynamic in the sense that we took this um, land use data in temporal format and we chopped it up basically into four time slices. And so moving from one time size into another, the land use would be varied. And so this allowed us to provide actual increases in forestry and other temporal vegetation changes, providing us with the dynamic recharge data that we utilized. Also, we had improved and verified lake water levels, which provided us with confidence when utilizing these lake water levels in our model. And also the collaboration between DWS and Sayon allowed us to have um, uh, survey data with reference to heights for above mean sea level of certain points in the area. And lastly, borehole and stream flow measurements that were taken um, some before my master's thesis and some by me and some help from my colleagues during my master's thesis helped us um, or helped me in calibrating and validating the model much better. The second approach to improving the model was with regards to the modeling approach being used as the ACRU model um, configuration had to be revised for our modeling approach. So the ACRU model was run in distributed mode to be able to allow us to use a grid-based approach and sensitivity tests were conducted to certain parameters um, to see which um, parameters uh, that we charge is actually sensitive to the most. Now, the grid-based approach allowed us to assign recharge values to each of the different grid cells. And this resulted in reduced generalization of topographic and climate conditions across the entire model domain. Also, the grid-based approach allowed for better spatial compatibility between the ACRU and ModFlow model as ModFlow is uh, inherently a grid-based model. And lastly, um, this grid-based approach allowed us to have better spatial representation of recharge across the entire model domain. Now, looking at just one of the parameters that recharge is sensitive to, which is rainfall, I won't go into detail regarding the other parameters. But just for reference, um, what we found was that for the latter portion of the graph, essentially, the recharge had an almost steady response to rainfall, whereby a 10% increase in, in rainfall resulted in almost 30% increase in recharge. This indicated the high degree of sensitivity that our model 
um, the, the recharge in our model, the Aqua model, add to rainfall. And this further supported the grid-based approach that allows for better spatial distribution of rainfall across the model domain, as it has been shown that our model is very sensitive to recharge, to rainfall, pardon me. Now, before I go into the results, the updated groundwater model had to be recalibrated to obtain the up-to-date groundwater levels and lake water levels for the area, which can also be referred to as the status quo model. But before showing you guys um, the lake water and groundwater levels, I'd just like to give you an illustration of the differences in recharge that went into my updated model and the previous model by Bruce Calby. So what we're looking at here is the recharge across um, a forestry plantation area um, using our grid-based approach. So these, these are just a couple of grid cells that I took that I extracted from the area. Now, um, so this is basically a temporal illustration of recharge um, in, in our model as my model uses a, a time period based number format instead of just normal dates. But that's not the point. The point is that what I'm trying to make is um, when we compare the recharge uh, temporarily across the, the model simulation and we overlay that with the recharge that went into the previous model by Professor Bruce Kelby. What we saw was that the earlier simulation period, the recharge was more comparable when looking at the latter uh, recharge or simulation period. We saw that the previous model by Professor Bruce Kelby started to receive negative recharge data, whereas with our model, we just had decreasing um, uh, recharge, which is reflective of the decreases in rainfall occurring in the area. Now, the negative recharge values indicate groundwater suction by forestry plantations. This was accounted for, um, as I mentioned, to keep in mind that the previous modeling approach utilized the groundwater subroutine in the ECHO model. And so this was able to capture how forestry plantations were drawing up water from mainly the inter intermediate store, around the intermediate storeway and the groundwater fringe. Whereas with our model, we were not able to capture this as well. However, as I mentioned that there is no conclusive approach um, as to which model uh, simulation or which method to provide recharge is correct, as we were mainly focusing on getting the spatial distribution on of recharge correctly in the model. Now, when we compare another critical land use, we have grassland in the area and just looking at the grid cells in our updated model and the recharge across these grid cells, we found that there were much better spatial variation in recharge, which um, supported our approach and gave us confidence that our model was able to um, obtain spatially variable um, recharge, which was representative of the, the gradient in rainfall in the area. Now, when we overlay this again with the recharge that was provided to the previous groundwater model um, and just comparing the temporal differences, we found that similar to the previous uh, graph that I illustrated, the trend is almost the same, whereby the first half, um, the recharge is fairly comparable, whereas for the latter portion, the recharge going into our model is much more compared to the previous groundwater model by Bruce Calby. But the main thing with this recharge graph that I'm trying to show is that our model is utilizing a better spatial distribution of recharge. And also to keep in mind that our model is receiving much more recharge than the previous model did. Now, what does this mean for the groundwater and lake water in the, as a whole? So our map here illustrates the groundwater flow directions in the area. So the groundwater flow direction is illustrated by these brown arrows. And these flow directions are based on the uh, groundwater contour lines and associated depth values that were simulated by the model. One thing I'd like to show you here is that um, the groundwater catchment um, is self subjective It's not definite that it's of a certain size or certain type of shape. So, Using the updated model, we were able to demarcate the groundwater catchment of Lexibaya based on these groundwater controls and groundwater flow directions. And this is demarcated in black. 
And we can compare that to the previous groundwater catchment that was demarcated using the previous model by Professor Bruce Calby, which is demarcated in red over here. Now, the main difference is that on the southern side, my model has a wider uh, groundwater catchment, as well as on the northwestern side. And so this can be related to the differences in the amount of recharge going into both models. As I mentioned that my recharge, my, my model pardon me, has more recharge going into it. Now we can start to look at the different simulations. So what I'm going to show you is the lake level simulations and not the groundwater level simulations. The reason for this is because um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that the Lake Sibaya area is a groundwater, is a groundwater dependent area, and Lake Sibaya lake levels are a reflection of the groundwater levels and rainfall occurring in the area. So we are able to use the lake water levels to validate um, our groundwater model's performance. So that is why I'll just be focusing on the lake water levels during this presentation. Now, what we have here is our observed lake water levels in blue. And then we have the updated models, um, lake water level simulations in green, and the previous um, models, lake water level simulations in orange. So the two main things to take note of here is that Lexibaya has a quick response, which is um, yeah, it's, it's characteristic of quick responses, or just call them spikes if you may. And so the updated model was able to uh, account for these much better than the previous. Um, lake water model simulation, which sort of smoothed out a lot of these quick responses. Another thing to take into account is that both model simulations had periods of time when one was better than the other. And so this illustrates that there's still room for improvement, but however, our, our updated model simulations was able to give us enough confidence to be able to use our model to look at the different scenarios. Now, I'd like for you to just focus on the updated models, lake water level simulations. And I'd like to sort of paint a picture of what Lake Sibaya would, or the lake water levels of Lake Sibaya could have looked like um, if they did not introduce plantations in the groundwater catchment of Lake Sibaya or basically in the entire region as a whole. Now in, the, in my abstract, um, we said that there was a difference of 1.8 I think um, between the, obs uh, the observed and the simulated lake water levels if no forestry occurred. However, we were still um, tweaking or basically fixing the model as there were some issues going on. And so the final model, when we ran the simulation of no forestry, we saw that actually there was an over three meter difference in the simulated lake water levels compared to the observed. Um, lake water levels. Now this illustrates the significant impact that forestry plantations has had in the lake Sibaya system. And so this supports um, our approach of also looking at the impact of land uses in the lake Sibaya area and how we could go about and how different land uses could impact the system in the future. Now, we then took our model and used it to look into the future um, in response to the community members wanting to reutilize or wanting to look at alternatives to forestry plantations. Now, firstly, we had to uh, look at how the water system would behave under different climate scenarios, but keeping the land use constant. So we used CMIP6 climate projection data, which provided us with a warmer, wetter climate in a warmer climate climate and ran simulations with our land use constant from 2020 into the future. So our model actually ends in the year 2050. And so I will be able to show you guys those simulations in the next coming slides. But also uh, we took suggestions from the community members on the alternative land uses that they could look into um, as opposed to forestry plantations. So we have a number of land use scenarios here. However, we are still in the process of generating these scenarios. And so unfortunately, I won't be able to share with you these scenarios as yet. 
But uh, as a sneak peek, we can just look at the climate scenarios, the wet and dry future climate scenarios. And what we have here is our red line, which shows the dry climate scenarios, and our yellow line, which shows the wet future climate scenario. Now, both scenarios show a fairly uh, similar trend, and both scenarios show a worrying or concerning um, situation for the Lexi bio system. And so if the land uses are kept the same, and so they basically illustrate that subtle differences in climate can translate to big differences on the ground if land uses are kept the same. And so we then decided utilizing our climate scenario, climate scenario model, the next step is to then look at an alternative land uses on water resources. Um, yeah, using our wet and dry climate scenarios. So in conclusion, we utilized um, improved input data and different modeling approach. And what we saw was that our improved model was able to simulate the fluxes in the lake system much better than the previous model. And the future climate scenarios uh, yeah, indicate a concerning future for the lake by area under the current land uses. And so this emphasizes the need for us to look at the future impacts of changes in land use in the area. The time spent in the field, I would say, um, paid off in terms of the in-situ measurements which we were able to use in updating the groundwater model and also developing um, the revised aquasurface water model and linking the two. And although this was a very steep learning curve, um, it was particularly fun for me. But more importantly, the integration between the different disciplines was challenging and a learning experience for everyone involved. But it also shined a light on where we could improve on the different models and um, how we can apply what we have learned. Now, taking um, or bringing this back to the community, working with the community through this process, uh, we can collectively help the community members and key stakeholders to understand that the relative attribution of land use and climate on water resources, as well as the implications for these um, relative attributions to the economic sustainability in the area looking to the future. And it's important to note that we are not trying to predict the future, but rather looking at future scenarios focused on helping people understand that the changes they do in land use will have uh, impact on the availability of water in the future. Now, yeah, thank you for listening to my study. I would like to close there. And I hope um, you were able to learn something or pick up on some new, uh, some new information. And yeah, um, I'm open to questions. Yeah. Great. Kalu, thank you so, so much for that very interesting talk. I might be a bit biased. <laughs> I would now like to invite the floor for questions. Please feel free to, to raise your hand um, to ask Kulu any particular questions of clarity or provide any suggestions on how we can improve the project approach. Um, please feel free to, to raise your hand. Right, I've got one hand. I've got to get my head around who's where. Um, Where's the hand? It's me, Sue. Ah, oh, there we go, Juliet. <laughs> Sorry, I've got back to Heidi. But, oh, Heidi, hi. Who had that, Heidi? Welcome. Hi, <laughs> thank, you. Be on board. thank you. Thank you. Kulo, it was a great presentation and great work done. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you've addressed it because I missed the first part of your presentation, but is the, the primary use of water the the timber plantations or is there also other abstraction for human use or something else that's driving the big decline or is it also very much climate driven have you worked out percentages for those sectors so thank you Haley, for that question um so we have not worked out percentages but uh, based on previous studies that have been taken place in the area the main driver of declines, as I mentioned in the presentation, is that uh, is forestry plantations 
as we could also have seen in the um, forestry, no forestry scenario on the lake water levels, and also the rainfall, um, the rainfall in the area as there's been a drought in the area, particularly from the early 2000s. And so it's sort of not conclusive as to whether the drought has ended for the Lake Sipa area as a whole. But in terms of abstractions, previous studies um, looked at the impact of those abstractions on the entire water system as a whole. And it was regarded that abstractions don't necessarily have that much of an impact. So that's why we are mainly focusing on land uses as we've seen that that's, uh, that's what could have a serious impact. And as we know, we cannot control the climate. So, yeah. Great, thanks, thanks, so, Heidi. I've, I've also made a note, so we we will include some of those percentages as we can in the in the in the study. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Um, just to say that you can use the land cover data to say what percentage um it's increased, and also from that other paper here that you guys worked on, uh, Ramjo one, um, what the increase was. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Sibonisa, it's so wonderful to have somebody from Isimangalisa here. Please go ahead with your question. Thanks, Sue, and uh, thank you to uh, Marcel. I, I, I think just supporting the first comment, I, I think in the, in the end, this is great work because it would tie in with um, some of the work that uh, Sue, you may be aware of, where we are trying to revisit the, the buffer zone uh, tool for the park. So this gives great insight in terms of some of the factors that need to go into that process. And just supporting what Heidi is saying, I think as much as the work hasn't quantified the amount of abstraction, I think that should be future work in the sense that we have an idea because there's two parts to this exercise. While we could, from a management perspective, now strike a win in terms of understanding the impacts of forestry, um, the unintended consequences where we strike a win and there is a balance on the reduction of forestry, they could then unanticipated been an increase in extraction from, 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 from human use. And whilst you can never eliminate that aspect, we should have a discussion as well, emanating from this work with the relevant authorities on now the other uses, abstractive uses, then and, and try to get a common ground. Um, approach. So it would be nice as, as the later plug-in, if that's possible, um, to now have that quantified as well and simulated to say at the pace that it's going, this is how much that's also contributing. So we don't just try and deal with the one aspect, but we also have the second aspect in mind as well. Thank you. Thank you so that's much, Sibonito. Nkule, would you like to respond? Yeah, I would. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you, Sibani. So, so um, for the scenarios that we're busy generating, one aspect that we included was sort of a population increase in the lake water abstraction, but it's not that much of an increase in the population that we consider. And I think it would be nice to look at what if the population increased significantly exponentially in the area. Um, what would what would happen then? You know, human being is not very predictable. So thank you. That is a, a good a good suggestion. And so I think when we've got a good handle in the model, we can then start looking at those uh, scenarios. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so I also just want to add as part of the economic model, so so there are two components to the economic model. The one is just economic drivers of, of change. Um, and it's it's got its own component, so it's got the same climate data going into it. So it will tell us if you know it's too hot for the crops or the crops bomb out. And then we we're linking the the where we can to to the hydro output in terms of you know if you've got a borehole for irrigation, if there's actually going to be enough water for it. But one of the sector components of the model is so what what we're doing is is looking at relative impacts of different sectors. So tourism, for example, if we were to optimize tourism, 
what would the impact be on on the economic livelihood of people in that area versus other forms of of land use so so we are going to be looking at that within the economic component of the model i think i saw Nkululeko had a hand up i don't see her anymore um are you there if not i'm going to jump to zach zach go ahead hello <clears throat> So just a question on the model itself. I'm, I'm not much on the science side, but working with the Egegasini crowd, I've come to, come to understand um, and the model that we work with as, um, as a Fortran app that solves fluid equations. What is the model in this case? So is it, how's the logic defined and executed, I guess? Um, pardon me, may please repeat your question. I had a bit of interference in my earphones. So are you asking what type of model are we utilizing? So more, more about how it works, just out of interest. So I'm very, very oh. low base level here. Okay, no problem. So we're using the accrued surface water model to simulate essentially the water movement from the surface into the groundwater store. Then we're taking that water that is moving into the groundwater store and putting that into our groundwater model as we charge into our groundwater model. So our groundwater model, essentially what it does is that, so imagine we have an entire area or a map, and then we have different boreholes in the area and yeah, different boreholes and wells in the area. So what it does is that you would import um, um, groundwater data for each of those boreholes or basically borehole well level data, and then import other different uh, parameters such as the hydraulic conductivity in the area, the storage properties of the, of the aquifers if there is that information available. And then we calibrate our groundwater model by so, so that it can able, so that it's able to simulate um, groundwater levels that are fairly similar to the observed um, borehole water levels. And so, yeah, essentially that is what, um, that is what the groundwater model is about, but then it's, it becomes much more complex as there are different packages that can be used in order to start simulating lake waters that are dependent on the ground water. So with that, we're able to couple the groundwater model with the lake package where we're able to look at the flow or the seepage of groundwater into um, the lake. And also we are able to include rainfall and evaporation onto the lake directly. So for that, we won't be able, so that we don't have to utilize the surface water model to simulate the lake or other water bodies that are mainly dependent on groundwater. But yeah, it's um, so basically that's just, just a bit, I don't want to go into too much detail regarding that. That was maybe too complicated at the end. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, Zach, as we take it forward, you're welcome to, to sit in on and, and give us some ideas as well. Does that, uh, that help you? I was actually asking if it was like a spreadsheet that had calculations or if it was an R script or, but <laughs> so okay. maybe it's, another time. Just to answer that, it's, 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 a, it's a program essentially that's developed on Python coding. Ah, so okay. sort of, uh, yeah, it has a, a graphical user interface, but if you are very good with coding, you can obviously um, just use that Python uh, window. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. That's uh, that's it. So, Thanks. Cool. Um, I'm going to move on to Julia Glende, and then after that, there's a question from Ryan in the chat, and then I'm going to ask uh, another Isi Mangalisa colleague, Ryan Sidaris, after after that. So Julia, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Kula. This was great to see. Um, I asked earlier in the chat, is it possible to go back to the um, forestry, no forestry graph? Just out of, I wanted to see, I didn't, I didn't feel like I got to look at it quite long enough. Um, yeah. Oh, you don't have a forest, you don't have one with your model with forestry and your model with no forestry on one. So, so this is the model with no forestry and so this is the lake water oh, okay. simulation with forestry and basically the status quo conditions okay okay no I, it was great i was curious about um sort of the importance of not being able to have that capillary rise like the plants withdrawing from the groundwater 
um, in there. And if you have a sense of um, how much that might be contributing, um, it does seem like it's like the vegetation still having a very big impact, even in this way of of modeling it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, what we can look at in terms of whether having that um, capillary suction there or whether it's better to not have it there is basically um, understanding what the recharge is, 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 is mainly made up of. So if we have, um, so if basically um, our area has forestry plantations, and we are taking recharge that's showing capillary rise. Um, it's not necessarily, yeah, our, our recharge that is, that is, that is um, not showing capillary rise doesn't necessarily mean that there is still more water going into those specific times. So as you can see in the, let me just show you that here, even though we have um, negative recharge in the previous model, we mainly had no recharge going into our model. And so the capillary rise can said to be have been accounted for in the evaporation that was used in the acrosurface water model. So this recharge, as I mentioned, is being simulated in the acrosurface water model. And so um, you, we could think of it as that this um, capillary rise, which is actually just evaporation, basically, it's, it's, mm. it's evapotranspiration being taken up by the plantations. And so it could have been taken, um, accounted for in the evaporation being given into the aquasurface water model, but we have not looked into that in detail as yet. Thanks. I have another very, sorry, a quick question also about um, mod flow. When you do a climate change scenario in mod flow, does the lake evaporate more in mod flow? And then does that cause like the groundwater gradient, like more the lake evaporates more and then more water, groundwater flows into the lake and that also evaporates, you know, it kind of sucks it out when it's warmer. Does mod flow have that lake evaporation in it? Yeah, so as I was um, explaining to the previous in the previous question that there is a, a package that we utilize in the groundwater model that is able to simulate the lake. And so in that package, we input um, lake input data, which is the rainfall and the evaporation and the lake water levels. And so um, I'm, what I'm getting from your question is that basically is the model able to account for if there's more evaporation in the lake Will, the, will there be more um, groundwater movement into the lake to sort of try to balance that? Um, am I right in that? Um, yeah, yeah. The lake will eventually sort of suck out of the, if the groundwater gradient is towards the lake and then the lake drops because of evaporation, you know, it keeps sort of flowing out yeah. and evaporating and flowing out and evaporating, it draws the whole thing down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and, and, yeah, it does sort of, so what I can say is the model does sort of take that, um, it does sort of you know, account for that because um, we don't necessarily use um, the lake water levels to calibrate the model. So we only use the groundwater levels um, in the area to calibrate the model. So if we have um, more water being lost in a sense to the lake water package, then in order, so in order for the model to keep up with the observed groundwater levels, it has to pump water into that area where water is being sucked. So it sort of balances each other out in that sort of sense. I'm not sure if you're able to follow with me. Yes, I think so. Thanks. Sorry, I don't want to take all the time. I know other people have questions. Thank you, Julia. Thank Thanks. You. We, we, we can chat, Juliet. Uh, Julia. I think you've got some nice ideas there. Um, I just want to go to Ryan B on the chat. He said, nice talk. Could you use the groundwater catchment map to define priority groundwater areas important for the recharge of the lake to identify areas that com can accommodate plantations. This could be used um, to model land use or land use configuration. So essentially asking, can you use the model to say where we should and shouldn't plant forests, uh, eucalyptus, eucalyptus forest? Could it um, okay, yeah. So to answer that, I, I wouldn't want to answer it directly because 
there is also um, differences in the interconnectivity of the aquifers in different areas. Um, so there's another MSc student who was looking at the interconnectivity of, of aquifers using isotopes. And so um, I think I would have to answer that question using both of the results from my modeling and that, uh, and that study. And so with that being said, um, certain areas do, do, does have more interconnectivity in aquifers, basically meaning that there is more water in that area for forestry to suck up. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we should plant there because as we have been um, trying to illustrate that forestry is the main um, um, water user in our area. And so it's still going to suck up the water that we have left. And so we don't have rivers trying to replenish the, 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 our catchment. So we're still gonna lose that water in any case. So I wouldn't necessarily say um, just because there is better inter interconnectivity than aquifers or there's more water there that we should start planting there. Great. Thanks, Kalu. And now for those of you who don't know, I'd just like to welcome Dr. Rian Sadaris, who is the new Isimangaliso ecologist, and we're really happy to have you on board. Ryan, please go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you for, for the introduction as well. Um, yes, so my question is um, because uh, Lake Sibaya is one of our, our focus um, is to be regions as well. Um, have your model considered also the soil types within that area? Because I'm assuming that the recharge and it will be affected with the soil type in that area. And then also the resolution in terms of if you're going to interpret uh, the, the scale of it. So it might change from this region to that region. And then Lastly, is that did you also consider maybe temperature as a variable? I know you have evaporation, but then I think those factors play hand in hand with in terms of your recharge and your discharge within that area. Okay, yeah. So firstly, uh, thank you for that question, Ryan. Um, so in terms of the soil in the uh, model, um, so the soil part is being accounted for in the surface water model. So basically, um, yeah, my groundwater model is um, looking at the geo geohydrology. It's taking water that is going from the soil into the geohydrology. So I'm mainly just looking at the geohydrology. But in the aquasurface water model, um, I cannot specifically answer on the, the soil distribution used as um, Dr. Michelle Touche could answer that better. But in terms of the spatial distribution, we are using a one kilometer by one kilometer square grid. So um, I would assume that the, that's how basically, if there is a, a, a change in the spatial distribution of soil, that's how they, it would mainly um, be distributed or change across the area. And um, the last question in terms of temperature. So, I, I did not explain it as, as, as effectively. So um, in order for the uh, accrued model to um, calculate evaporation, the input data that it uses is maximum and minimum temperature. So that is how it's able to um, calculate evaporation. So yeah, temperature is taken into account and even over our lake, our lake are uh, using the lake package for the area. So she is providing me with the rainfall and evaporation input data for the lake. And so that evaporation data is also based on the, the, the maximum and minimum temperatures. But yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for that. Um, I'm now gonna jump to Mkuleleko's question. Um, she asked if you consider using SPI and SPEI. It would be interesting to see how drought has been affecting the region, especially in your time of application. So, okay. Um, firstly, I am not sure what SBI and SBEI is, as I've only been starting to learn groundwater modeling in my master's. And so maybe if, if you can um, explain it to me a bit, I can sort of try to answer the question better. 
and I'm also not a groundwater or a surface water hydrologist, but I think it's got something to do. Maybe Michelle can jump in and uh, comment on this one, if she's still with us. Michelle? Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm presuming that they're meaning the, the standardized precipitation index. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we haven't done those calculations yet. We've been focusing on the modeling. But we are working with a group from um, University of Cape Town, and they're doing a lot of work on characterizing the climate over the region and <clears throat> the different droughts and rainfall patterns. Um, I'm sure that is something that they will probably look at in the broader project. Um, yeah, so there are a number of different groups working on different aspects. And we're trying to pull those different interdisciplinary aspects together. Um, we're not quite yet there, but it's getting very exciting trying to get everything together. So I'm sure that is a part that will come out as we, we move forward. And, and as a team, we've, we, we've learned that nobody's allowed to use acronyms because when an economist starts using acronyms to a hydrologist or a climate person, or vice versa, things fall fall apart very quickly. So we've had to learn how to how to communicate very easily across disciplines. Um, have I missed any questions? Any other questions in the chat? Any other hands up? Okay, I'm not seeing. Going once, going twice, going three times, and I, I just want to. Oh, there, Sibonuso, please go ahead. I think it's just more of a last comment than to say when this 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 has been great work, um, colleagues. Sue knows our situation from from my side. I'm I'm more I'm not even on the science side, more on the management side and the compliance side. So always the very next question becomes now how, when, and where can we now start having a process and agree on how we factor in some of these um, recommendations, outcomes, and so on to then put us, put us in a best practice position as opposed to being in a reactive position nine times out of 10. So this kind of work with the simulations allows us an opportunity to now be at a proactive starts. Hence, my first thought was, this is great work now, perhaps a, a session with uh, your, your team, Sue, on you now looking at what we're working on with the buffer zone tool, and start speaking the language of saying, how do we now gel the two so that this work actually finds its, its, its space in, in implementation of management actions. Absolutely, Sibonisa, and, and the intention is to have before the, the project still got a few months to go and, and the crux of it is going to be the, the economic modeling because we've realized when talking to the communities, all of them are very, very aware of the fact that that eucalyptus have a negative impact on the system and you can't talk to people about that without having some kind of alternative framework in mind. So we're hoping rather than sort of being a prescriptive approach, we can all work together. And the, the intention is to share the, the preliminary outcome with the traditional councils, but also to have a sector engagement where we, we've got it, the plan is to speak to you directly as Isimangaliso. But what we also want to try is to have a joint uh, Isimangaliso is in Velo. Sapi, Mondi, and other forestry companies in the area engagement to actually discuss these results um, in, in a mutual forum. Um, and I'm hoping Wild Trust is going to come to our um, aid there in terms of facilitating that sort of exchange. So it is on the cards, you just haven't received the invitation yet. So um, it, is, it is coming and, and hopefully through the processes and sharing a neutral stance just with using, looking at the data, um, and also translating it into, into how it affects people's pockets. Um, uh, yeah, hopefully we can start uh, creating a critical mass for positive change in the area. I hope that answers your question. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, Sue. Thanks very much, um, Cor. Great. Okay, um, we're just over two minutes, but I was that's my prerogative. I was letting it go. I just wanted to um, again thank Kulu and thank everybody for attending. Um, and I would like to introduce the next seminar, which is going to be on the 6th of July. It's going to be Mark Jacobson from our WASI node. And some of the data we collect needs to be harvested into systems. Um, and basically, he's going to be talking about the information architecture for open data science, connecting data producers, that's us, and data consumers, that might be Issy Mangaliso, um, with Seon's open data portal API. So please have a look out for that. Um, and, and let's get these flows from questions to collecting data to actually utilizing the data in as many ways as possible. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, well done, Kulu. Um, and yeah, we'll see you at the next say on seminar. Please feel free to, to contact myself or Kulu if you have any additional questions and suggestions. I've noted some in the chat. And we will certainly in, include and refine on how we present some of those those figures. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Um, yeah. Thanks uh, all. And thank you, Kate, for always being in the background to help us. Thanks.